Hattie McDaniel became the first African American to win an Oscar for a performance in Gone with the Wind. Dude asked Hattie, is it, don't you feel bad playing a maid? She said, well, I can be a maid at $2 a week, or I can play a maid at $200 a week. There were other actresses, among them Butterfly McQueen, who transformed their servant roles into comic art. We've got to have a doctor. I don't know nothing about birthing babies. During the 30s and 40s, Louise Beavers was one of the hardest working maids in Hollywood. She carried the servant role over to television in 1952 as Beulah. If marriages are made in heaven, my guardian angel has sure been loafing on the job. <laughs> Louise had class. Louise knew how to talk. She dressed up, she walked in, and how do you do, and made you proud. So you didn't mind so much when she'd get on the screen and say, Hey there, Miss Lucy. You didn't mind it as much. You see, the, the people of the era understood what was going on at that time. There was no need for Louise Beaver or Hattie McDaniels to think that they were going to ever be the ingenue. They understood that. And so they took, which I think is fantastic, what they had. <laughs> and worked it and made it into something magnanimous. They took that that was supposed to be a slur, a put down, and turned that into a wonderfulness. I'm proud of that. Oh, Mr. Benny, this is Rochester. As Jack Benny's butler of Rochester, Eddie Anderson's self-assured attitude turned the master-servant relationship inside out. Well, the feistiness is if you got away with more, as if the slave can break a few rules. Unlike uh, Burt Williams or um, Stephen Fetchett, he was he was not bent over. He he didn't seem to be awkward. And of course, you always knew Rochester was was smarter than Jack Benny. He was wittier. He was much more clever, much more resourceful, and he always seemed to be out to do more for himself than for this boss. <laughs> Hello? 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 Hmm. <coughs> Must have hung up. I wonder who... <laughs> Rochester! Oh, hello, boss! <laughs> You've been sitting here all the time? Uh-huh! With the phone. Didn't you hear the phone? Uh-huh. Well, why didn't you answer it? This is my day off! <laughs> Mantan Moreland made his name as Charlie Chan's number one chauffeur, Birmingham Brown. Abba, 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 Abba. Uh, Abba. Oh, my goodness, I done forgot the magic word. Birmingham. Oh, Mr. Chan, you sure did lose some weight. In Hollywood, Mantan had to play a servant. But in race movies, black films made for a black audience, Mantan was a star. What kind of book is that? Oh, man, this is a jujitsu book. Jujitsu? Did you never heard of a jujitsu book? No. What, what, what did that do? This book here protects me from all men like him. Even protect me from stick-up men and hold-up men. You mean that book will protect you from a robber? Yeah. Oh, how's the book going to protect you from a robber? All right. You act like you're a robber and act like you're going to stick me up. I'm going to stick you up, huh? Yeah. Stick him up. Now, you got your gun right on me. Right in your face. Now, you think you can stick me up, don't you? I know I can. You can't stick me up. No. Nah. Oh, I'm laughing at you. Laughing at me. You know all I have to do? What is that? Look right here on page one. Now, I grab you right here. Yeah. I got you by your pulse. Yeah. You can't move. No. You can't touch me. No. 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 Mm. You know what? I must have been on the wrong page. When you think about all of those Mantan Marlins and Butterfly McQueen and what they did, they did well. And it was accepted. I mean, they was invited to the NAACP and given awards because they was the heroes. They was top draw. But you can't take out of context and, and reach back now and review them because it was, it was their backs we stepped on 
to, to get to where we are. Black sports heroes Jesse Owens and Joe Lewis displayed the dignity and heroism that the Hollywood actors could not. And during the Depression, when blacks were the last hired and the first fired, every triumph on the field or in the ring was a victory for black folks. At that time, we clustered together for many reasons, safety, economy, uh, the need of each other, the problems we had, all of those things made us cluster together. So literally, we had the same conversations, we had the same feelings, we had basically the same thoughts, we were having the same situations. For entertainment, blacks had their own ethnic theater, the Chitlin Circuit, a group of urban theaters of which the greatest was the Apollo. If you got a great response in the Apollo Theater, you have passed. That was your passing. That was your graduation. You were ready. But if you didn't make the Apollo Theater, forget about it. They're the most critical audience in the world. At the Apollo, comedy teams relied on the exaggerated language and costumes of the minstrel tradition. While solo performers, Pigmeat Markham, Moms Mabley, Dusty Fletcher, and Tim Moore took this tradition and laid the foundation for modern day stand-up. Of all the comedians from what we call the old school, Tim Moore, who became Kingfish in the Amos and Andy series, was possibly the most imitated and the most emulated by all the personalities in show business because of the way he talked. The thing that he used to say, holy mackerel, sapphire, do the name Delphine have any meaning to you? Those little intonations were copied by, uh, by everyone. Well, the next cotton that you see, you ask him, and he'll explain to you about dough. He'll tell you that a dough was made but folks would have a lot of time. But when that cat spoke to me, yeah, by me being punctual, my time there was up. And right then, the wind got well. What do you mean the wind got well? Got rid of its pain. Yeah, yeah, I got to go Now, you know, I ain't never drank no whiskey before that won't let you go nowhere. <laughs> Dusty Fletcher, he was a particular favorite of mine. I saw him when I was about 12 years old. And I remember he called out to an imaginary, uh, imaginary character called Richard. And I'm pretty sure that's where the, the later hit song, Open the Door, Richard, came from. But uh, he would say, Richard? And then he'd look at the audience and say, that's the boy I room with. <laughs> yes, I get in the house here and wake up everybody so I can go to sleep. That's the way I do that, you know. I, 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 I see him. I bet, man, I see him. Hmm. I hope you don't, Richard. <laughs> that's the boy I room with. But I can't explain why that is funny, but it knocks me out now and it knocked me out when I was 13. Remember, you wore costumes in those days. Your costume depicted what you were, like with the, the top hat, the stovepipe hat mashed down, always the tuck, big tuxedo coat, tight-fitting pants. You develop a character that you sold to the audience. So I like Cab Calloway. Everybody's talking about it. I do it. Say Cab treats me like a dog. He does. Treats me like a dog. He called me a dog. Yes, he did. What did he call me? An old dog. Sometimes I wish I was a dog and he was a tree. <laughs> now, Mom's made you as the first woman to really make it in this arena. It's really a man's arena, but she becomes a star in her own right. And, um,. She's a stand-up, and probably the first female stand-up that we, we know of. And I've seen moms in the Apollo Theater as early as 1950, and I saw her in the Greek Theater with the Temptations as late as 1970-something, a year or two before she passed on. So mom spans a, a whole, I guess, maybe two full generations as a favorite. And it's old, old. Dead, puny, moldy man. I mean an old man. Oh, 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 old man. He was older than water. And twice as weak. Mom was something else. Like she said, when he died, I had him cremated. He was going to get hot for me one way or another. 
<laughs> Pig Meat Markham was one of the last of the old time comedians. Like moms, he kept several generations laughing. Yeah, let me tell you about that bull of my father's. You see, right out of my father's farm, the Santa Fe Rays would run by every afternoon at five o'clock. And that bull is so fast and so smart, every afternoon about five o'clock, he goes way up to the far end of that pasture and race that train five and a half miles. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Would you believe it? That bull beat that train by half a mile. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Some bull. I know it's some bull. <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, he, this court is in session. The Honorable Pigmeat Markham presiding. When Sammy Davis Jr. did his Here Come the Judge skit on Laugh-In in the 60s, he was paying homage to Pigmeat's most popular character, the judge. How do you feel, Your Honor? Fine, ten dollars. But Your Honor... <laughs> Me. I got time on my hands this morning, and everybody gonna do some time today. And I'm gonna even do five years myself. I'm dealing the book of years this morning, and the further I go back in this book, the more years you're gonna get. And I'm starting on the last page. Like many old timers, Pigmeat Markham started out in blackface and didn't take it off until the 40s. So I says to Pigmeat, blackface shouldn't be now today. You don't need blackface on your on your to do your act, man. That's that's, that's gone. That's passe. He said, "Listen, what do you know about comedy? You just started your comedy act last year. What do you know?" I said, "I know one thing. You don't need to be in blackface to get a laugh today." Well, so so so. Well, this is tradition, and so so so. So I had one line that stopped him cold in the tracks. I said, suppose you guys were on radio where they couldn't see you. Would you put black on your face? <laughs>